Okay, good afternoon everybody. I'm Manos Mavrikakis and I'm co-chairing this afternoon session with um, John Kitchen. John is uh, actually occupied in another session at the moment and he promised to be here before too long. Um, I don't want to take any of the time of the keynote speaker that uh, we have today. Uh, this is uh, uh, Professor Philippe Sauté from the University of Lyon, France. Uh, Philippe has been an outstanding uh, colleague in the area of computational catalysis, deriving fundamental insights from the surface science perspective, moving into the uh, more applied uh, reactive environment. And uh, again, uh, I won't take more of your time, Philippe. Uh, we are all looking forward to your presentation about nanoscale effect in heterogeneous catalysis. Thank you very much, Manos. Good afternoon, everybody. First, I'd like to thank the organizers for the very nice uh, invitation to present this uh, lecture. And it's a great pleasure to be in Louisville uh, today. As you all know, catalysts are usually small particles deposited on high surface area support. Here, for example, you see an image of a small platinum particle on an alumina uh, support. But what's happening when this particle is interacting with the support, when it meets the gas phase, and what it, when it is the, the place of a catalytic reaction? Those are very important fundamental questions. And today, I'd like to take you on a journey, on an atomic scale, virtual journey, on such small particle deposited on support in order to answer some of these uh, important uh, questions. Now, one, one point now is size. We will con consider platinum particles on gamma alumina, small size, smaller than those that uh, Gabor Samajai showed this morning, but still realistic. Actually, people, you, maybe you, know how to create such small nanometer and sub-nanometer particles that are very useful, especially in the catalytic reforming of, of NAFTA. And here the size is typically 10 to 20 atoms, and that's very nice for, for us for models. And even people are able to image small platinum-3 particle on the uh, gamma alumina surface. So various questions, as I already mentioned. Size, can we control the size? which is the influence of the size of the, of the particle. Stability, can we avoid sintering and keep the particle small? Shape, those particles have tens, hundreds of shapes possible. Which one will be, will be good? How will all this be influenced by the support? Will it promote some electronic, specific electronic transfer? And finally, what about reactivity? First interaction with gas species like hydrogen, in, in my case and catalytic uh, reactivity. So for this trip, for this journey, we need a shuttle, and it's going to be theory. So the catalyst will be modeled by a small cluster, which will be deposited on an extended support. Actually, this cluster will be between 1 and 13 uh, atoms. We use DFT in the GGA uh, approximation, typically PW91 or, or, or PB. Now, one important aspect is how can we explore the various possible structures of those small clusters deposited on surfaces, interacting with, with gases. And for this, we will need MD. Uh, this will be explorative MD, okay, like uh, in our journey, which means that we will use the temperature just to be able to probe the potential energy surface and to probe the possible configurations, to find the best configurations, both for the particle and for the adsorbates on the particle. Okay. When needed, we use specific algorithms like the NEB, natural steam bag, for reaction pathways exploration. And there's one important point, is that in order to relate our DFT calculation with specific pressure and temperature condition, we need to link DFT with thermodynamics. And here we use first principle, atomistic, thermodynamic, where we do DFT calculation, 0K, but then we include the entropy coming from the gas phase uh, molecule, and this evaluated using an uh, ideal gas approach. Let's go. At first, we need a support, and this support will be a gamma alumina. Here we use a, a bulk model, 
which go beyond the uh, spindle model by allowing some non-spindle sites. And from that model, we cut surfaces. You, show some, you, you, you saw some already this, uh, this morning in this, in this room. So this will be the 100 termination. In alumina, we have both octahedral and tetrahedral aluminum. The 100 only expose the, and cut uh, the octahedral, forming five coordinated species. Contrast, the 110 will cut the tetrahedron, hence forming potentially aluminum O3 species. Why do I say potentially? Because in realistic conditions, those sites will not exist because of water. Water is present, especially during the preparation, and very difficult to remove, especially from those three coordinated sites. And so we can study this from the calculation by looking at the stability of those models as a function of hydration, as a function of OH density. Here this is the surface free energy as a function of temperature. Each line represents a given coverage, a given OH density. The red line here, horizontal, will be the bare termination. And then you have more, you, you have more or less, you add some OH on the, on the surface. And so the most stable situation here for given pretreatment temperature of the alumina corresponds to the lowest line. For example, for 800 Kelvin, you will get 6 OH per nanometer square. So the nice, very highly Lewis acidic, acidic ILO3 species is dead, okay? Because it's transformed into ILO3 OH. Well, it's dead, potentially. We'll see. Um, this terminal, the terminal OH here, can be substituted by chlorine. That's a very important uh, aspect to create more reactive, uh, more acidic um, alumina surfaces. Uh, this would be this chlorinated termination that we'll consider also in a minute. In contrast, on the other surface, the one zero zero, in usual retreatment temperature conditions, 800 Kelvin, the surface will remain bare. The water interaction on these surfaces is weaker, so it's easier to dehydrate. That's enough for the scenery. Now let's consider our particle. First, very simple scheme. Particle alone in vacuum. Binding energy as a function of number of atoms. This is the binding energy normalized, divided by the number of platinum atom of the particle as a function of number of atoms between one and 13. So as you can see, there's a very big slope. Uh, the particles want to grow big. Uh, and you want, it wants to grow big until it reaches here the bulk, binding energy, which is here at the bottom, uh, the slide. Uh, so there's a clear trend on the thermodynamics to center. The particle wants to increase its size just to reach a higher coordination for the platinum atom simply. Now, what's happening when we put these small particles on the, on the support? Well, they will be strongly stabilized. The binding energy will decrease. And this is especially the case for small particles here on the left. Mostly the support have the same effect. Okay? Small difference in it here for very small particles. But then, same effect, much flatter, but still trend to, to grow bigger. Okay? Still the binding energy is getting more stable, more stabilized when the size is, uh, is increased, despite the stabilization by the, by the support. And here you can see what's happening. Formation of oxygen platinum, aluminum platinum bonds. And of course, the small particle will have more atoms at the interface, so will benefit more from that stabilization from the, from the support. This is, this is simple deposition. And if there's a simple, there's a complex deposition. On some of the surface, on some of the oxide surfaces, we have species. We have OH, chlorine, and some of these species will be able to migrate on top of the particle. And this will result in a strong stabilization of our small clusters. You see here, especially 
for the chlorinated termination, which are here in purple and in green, in contrast to the hydrated or the dehydrated 100 termination. We have a strong stabilization here with a local minimum for a size of 3. It means that increasing the size, starting from 3, needs to, it's endothermic, okay? You need to go up in energy in order to increase the size at, at this point. We have a local minimum, local because still the very big particles here will be woolly here. So, what's happening, okay? More specifically, when we have these migrations of support species on the, on the cluster, well, this is shown on this, on this slide. This is the scheme of this hydrated 110 termination. And there's one important aluminum atom. This is this one. This would be the aluminum O3 if it was not hydroxylated. Now it is LO3OH. And initially, as you can see here on the left, the small PT3 cluster just comes, lands, and interacts with the oxygen of the, of the OH. Now, this is the simple deposition. But then it can do better. It can do better by displacing the OH and taking its place, forming very strong aluminum-platinum bonds here. But where is the OH going? Well, the OH is just coming on top of the small uh, particle. And here we have also a migration of one hydrogen. So this can be seen as an insertion of, this, of the cluster into the aluminum OH bond and into the OH bond, which is here. And this provides a much better addition of the cluster with the, with the support. Of course, you have to break the bond with the species, but this is compensated by the bond formation on top of the, of the cluster. So this migration effect are very important in stabilizing the small, the small particles. If you go from the OH terminated to the chlorinated terminated uh, surface here. This is similar. Uh, the chlorine here is sitting on the threefold coordinated, well, initially threefold coordinated uh, aluminum, and it migrates on top of the, of the cluster. Now the energy stabilization is bigger, okay? Previously it was 123 kilojoules per mole that was gained from this migration in total. Now with chlorine it's close to 200 kilojoules per mole just because the chlorine platinum bond is stronger than the OH platinum. Huh? So this process here is more exo exothermic. Enough with, um, with size. Let's go to shape. And for shape, we will consider the platinum 13 particles. First, in gas phase, you have to know that this small particle can adopt many shapes. And some of them can be quite competitive in, in energy. This were explored by, by MD. So this is a summary of, the, of six. Not, not only the most stable ones. Those two here are the most stable ones. As you can see, there are low symmetry 3D shapes. If you think of a platinum-13 cluster, you say, hey, platinum-13, this is the small cubic hydrogen. 363, six, three, okay, or 1 plus 12 around. Here, but this cubic iron extracted from the bulk will be 322 kilojoules per mole less stable than this low symmetry 3D shapes. We have also one interesting structure here, which is a biplanar structure. Seven atoms, six atoms. But still, this structure is 128 kilojoules per mole less stable. So you might think too high in energy will never be uh, accessible. Let's wait a minute. This is in vacuum. Now let's put this cluster on the 100 dehydrated surface of aluminum. The order, the stability order, is completely changed. This is the structure which was the most stable in gas phase. Now it's number five, plus 62 kilojoules per mole. Best one here now is the BP, the biplanar structure, because it benefits from a much better addition on the, on the support. Compare here 783 kilojoules per mole for the interaction energy to 300 for that one. Huh? Much better interaction with the, with the support. Completely reverse the energy order. Despite the 128 kilojoules 
less terrible character of this structure in gas phase. The cube, or the cubohedron, well, deforms, but still remains at 150 kilos per mole, less stable than this most favored biplanar structure. Now that we know what is the structure of this particle, we can put it into a pressure of gas. And this will be H2. This is quite complex to explore from the calculation because there might be various numbers of hydrogen atoms on these clusters. We explored one, then two, four, six, all the uh, even number until we, the system didn't want to have any more uh, hydrogen. And still, for a given number, this is six for example, we need to find what is the best position for these six atoms. And there are many possibilities, many configurations. How to obtain the best one? Here we use MD. You see here? This is MD at 1200K, 12 picosecond uh, trajectory. You see the energy here as a function of time. And then we take all the minima along that trajectory, all the energy minima. We optimize them, we quench them to 0K. We compare the energy and we obtain what is the best confirmation position for the six hydrogen atom on this uh, platinum-13 particle deposited on uh, gamma alumina. At this point, for the MD, we thought initially that the particle would not change too much in structure and shape, so we kept it fixed. On this slide, I will show you, step by step, one by one, what are the best position of hydrogen and the resulting structure of the cluster coming from a geometry, the final geometry optimization that I previously described. Uh, at this point, there will be some turbulences, so I would advise you to fasten your seat belt. <laughs> this is the first one, goes on the, on, on the edge. Four, six, eight, 10, 12, 20, 24, up to 40 hydrogen can sit on this small platinum-13 particle. And you've seen that the particle deforms like crazy. This is nice, but for us it was bad news because we assumed that it wouldn't deform, which means that we had to do it all again. Now including the degrees of freedom of the particle in the, in the MD, which we did. Okay, I will not show it due to time. But what we find is that the optimal shape at high coverage will be now the cubotator. So we have a reconstruction, shape transformation from the biplanar back to the cubic hydrogen, which was, remember, more than 300 kilos were less stable when considered in vacuum. When would this transition occur? It occurs after 18. From 0 to, to 18, cluster is more or less biplanar in strong interaction with the, with the support, many bonds here. And at 18, suddenly, we have a change of shape going to the 3D cubic hydrogen and decreasing dramatically here the number of bonds with the support until we'll f we will fully cover this cubic hydrogen uh, with three hydrogen per platinum forming this kind of surface hydride and more or less detaching the cluster from the support. This shows that the cluster support interaction favors the biplanar while the cluster hydrogen favors the cubotary shape. So there's a fight. Support prefers the particle to be flat. Hydrogen prefers the particle to be cubotary, round. And at high coverage, of course, the hydrogen is winning. Now, in realistic temperature and pressure condition, would any of this form exist? What we did is that we did the thermodynamic calculation. Plotting here as a function of temperature and pressure, what is the most stable structure? What is the, what is the number of hydrogen atom on the, uh, on the cluster? And as you can see, if you go to very high temperature or low pressure and low pressure, you have the, the bare cluster, zero hydrogen atom. Then when you decrease the temperature or increase the pressure, you will populate the, the cluster with, with hydrogen. Here this, this is between four and six. In this spot here, we have a steep 
steep increase. And we reach 18. 18 is, is the, the green zone on this graph, where we see the transformation between the biplanar structure with modest number of hydrogen jump to the cubic hydrogen, which is heavily hydrogenated here. So, and then we can continue and finish here to occupy the, the, the top site. Initially, we occupy first bridge sites in this cubic hydrogen, and then when they are all occupied, we will occupy the, the top site. So we have a rather diverse number of hydrogen as a function of temperature and pressure, and we can reach very high number. In this area here, which is basically if you take room temperature and normal pressure, you will have mostly three hydrogen per surface platinum atom. Huh? You form a surface hydride, which fully stabilizes these cubic shapes by cancelling the the, 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 the broken bonds, okay, by cancelling the dangling bonds which are formed by cutting the cluster. Now let's go to, um, let's focus on some specific conditions. In the catalysis here, we will consider catalytic reforming. The reaction is done on such small particle, but it's done at high temperature, 800 Kelvin, and uh, close to normal pressure around 10, 10, uh, 10 bar. 10, 20 bar. But as you can see in this condition, we are in the zone where we are before the, 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 the transition. So the particle is, bipl is biplanar and the content of hydrogen is modest. Well, it's between 0 0.5 and 1.5 hydrogen per uh, platinum uh, atom of the, of the particle. Now, if you want to do your analysis at room temperature, it's easier. Say, so I will pump anyway, but no problem. I will pump, so I will remove the hydrogen by pumping. Well, not quite. If you are at room temperature in this small cluster, you'll be on the fully hydrogenated PTH3 type local uh, coordination. And even if you pump, it's going to be very difficult to remove this uh, surface um, hydrogen atoms. So starting from this, we, we design specific systems here in this area in order to probe the reactivity of those hydrogenated clusters with an alkane. And here we picked ethane. Uh, I know that if you consider the comparison with reforming, ethane is a bit small, but already it um, allows to, to develop quite a bit of chemistry comparing the, the hydrogenation, hydrogenolysis, and further cracking of the, uh, of, the, of the molecule. So this is what we did. And we considered four various possibilities here which can be described by these J parameters, which, is, which um, correspond to the ratio of pressure between H2 and the, the FA. So J basically describes the partial pressure uh, of, uh, of hydrogen. For small J here, we have a low hydrogen partial pressure, so we remain with a modest coverage in hydrogen, around four. Then for J equal 110, we are very close to the transition zone so we have a coverage between 6 and, uh, and 18. And then we have a point here at uh, 100. We also increase the total pressure so that we pass the transition and we are in the cubic shuttle form with a very high coverage between 20 and 26. So what kind of reactivity do we, do we see? What will be the free energy of C2 and C1 intermediates versus J, okay, as a function of the partial pressure of hydrogen? First, let's consider the symmetric ethane dehydrogenation. So we remove one hydrogen on the right and on the left and on the right. Ethyl, ethylene, vinyl, up, up to uh, uh, ethylene. This would be for pressure, for a J value of uh, one, where we have equal pressure of H2 and uh, ethane. And you can see here, the shape of the particle is changing along the, along the reaction. So does the number of hydrogen atom. Initially, for J equal 1, we are before the reconstruction. Uh, so the particle is mainly biplanar with a modest number of hydrogen atom. But then suddenly, with, with the vinyl species, which builds a stronger interaction with the, with the cluster, saturates better the platinum, we jump on the other side of the, of the limit, forming the cubic hydrogen and jumping to 19 hydrogen atom 
and equilibrium. For all these cases, notice that we had to consider several hydrogen counts and again determine which number of hydrogen would be the most stable on the, on the cluster as a function of the um, temperature and pressure uh, conditions. All these being done at 800 Kelvin. Now in, in terms of um, free energy, this would be the starting point where ethane is in gas phase. As you can see, all the intermediates correspond to positive free energy, which means that the, 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 the formation is, is endothermic. It will be more and more endothermic as we increase the J value from 0 0.01 here to, uh, to 100. So the more hydrogen on the cluster, the more difficult it's going to be for this uh, ethane to be uh, de dehydrogenated. We have a minimum here along, the, along this path, which corresponds to the uh, ethylene, and then ethylene can be dissolved. Okay, and here we gain again the entropy which was lost due to, due to adsorption, in order to the gas phase hydrogen. Of course, all these intermediates have a positive uh, delta G because the loss of entropy is quite high at this temperature of uh, 800 uh, Kelvin. Now, if we consider the asymmetric ethane uh, dehydrogenation, in this case, we will remove first all the hydrogen on the, on the right, going to ethylidine, and then when we're done with the right, we consider the, the left. As you can see, again, we have a change of shape from biplanar uh, to cubic hydrogen, and various numbers of hydrogen atoms in the optimal uh, conditions on this, uh, uh, on this cluster. For the, um, for the energy, we have uh, similar uh, profiles here. Note, before I forget, that these profiles are thermodynamic profiles. Okay? We only consider intermediates. At this point, I'm sorry we don't have the barriers that link those intermediates. Huh? I think this already gives some important insights on this, uh, on this reaction. For example here, the minimum in the pathway is associated to this ethylidine fragment. But now when we increase J, when we increase the hydrogen pressure and the number of hydrogen on the, on the cluster, we have a marked destabilization of this uh, ethylidine. We compare with ethylene on this slide. Uh, this would be the compared stability of ethylene, ethylidine, and uh, acetylene. We see that initially, of course, as I told you, ethylidine is more stable than ethylene. This is basically what Gabor showed this morning. Uh, but, uh, but then when we increase the hydrogen pressure for J larger than one, we reach conditions where the ethylidine is less stable than ethylene. So J here controls the relative stability between the absorbed ethylene and this ethylidine dead end uh, species that, of course, you don't want to form in, this, uh, in these conditions. Now, this was CH bond dissociation. What about the CC bond? What is the best step at which we can break this bond? If we start from low J, low number of hydrogen on the, on the particle, the direct breaking of the CC bond is less favorable than the CH dissociation. And actually, the best way to dissociate the CC bond, and I'm sure that Manos will not be surprised about, about that, uh, consider to, to, is, to, to, is associated to a situation where we have partially de dehydrogenated the, the, the molecule, and the best condition here corresponds to this H2 CCH, this vinyl fragment, where actually the CC bond cleavage becomes exothermic on this uh, small part. And then from those, those carbon species, CH6 species, we would go back to methane in gas phase or continue the dehydrogenation to form here what would be the precursors of coke. This was low J, small number of hydrogen on the particle. What's happening when we increase this hydrogen content? Well, first I want to remark here that at low J, we go through the same highest energy intermediate for the dehydrogenation, going to ethylene, or for the hydrogenolysis, 
So the CC bond breaking here is after ethylene on the pathway. Now, if we go to uh, Hygie, two main consequences. First one, the direct dissociation here, shown as dotted line, becomes favored. Because this later highly de de dehydrogenated C1 fragments become strongly de destabilized by the presence of numerous hydrogen on the, on the cluster. And second, no coke formation. Right? This species here will get more and more unstable when we increase the chain. So this can be summarized on this, uh, on this diagram, which shows again the highest energy intermediate on the best, on the most favorable pathway. And here we compa compare dehydrogenation and hydrogenolysis. As a function of, of J, of this ratio of, of pressure, initially J controls the number of hydrogen on the, on the cluster without any al alkane uh, species. 4, 18, 18, 20, 26 in this, uh, in, in this case. At low number uh, of hydrogen, the, um, this highest energy intermediates are reasonable energy. They'll be the same for the dehydrogenation and hydrogenolysis. Now, when we increase the number of hydrogen, we will destabilize both the uh, intermediates leading to dehydrogenation and those leading to hydrogenolysis. But the hydrogenolysis intermediates will be disfavored, will be destabilized more. This means that here we reach an optimal situation because at low J, we have the risk of coke formation or ethylidine formation from the, from the ethane. At high J, everything is very difficult, okay? All the species are very high uh, in energy. So we have, we have here an optimal situation, intermediate, for which we can have uh, stable, okay, catalyst, and selective into dehydrogenation. So, as a conclusion, hope that I showed you that first, adhesion on the support is very important for to stabilize smaller small clusters. And the nature of the surface is important. Especially the migration of surface species on the support on top of the cluster is a, a very important uh, factor in stabilizing the small, the small particles. Especially platinum-3 after migration appears as a local minimum on the potential energy surface. Clusters are functional. The, the shape will be different in gas phase and on the support, it actually can also vary with different support. Okay? This will be the 110 non hydrosylated support, and this would be the case of the, I'm sorry, this is the 100 non hydrosylated support, and this would be the hydroxylated 110 termination, where the addition of the cluster is less important so that it keeps the 3D shape that it likes to have. In, uh, in, in gas phase. Well, for hydrogen adsorption, the hydrogen adsorption modifies the shape of the cluster. We go from the biplanar back to the cuboctoidon shape in the presence of hydrogen. And there's also a big impact on the cluster support interaction. Competition between hydrogen and the support more hydrogen, less interaction with the, with the support. Size matters for hydrogen adsorption quite a lot. Indeed, on those small clusters, we have a very strong hydrogen adsorption, and we go to structures up to three hydrogen per platinum. Especially in normal condition, this is the type of structure that we, that we find, where we have a surface hydride being formed around the, the, the cluster. This is quite different from the extended one-on-one -on -one particle, which would be uh, our model for large extended surface, which would be our model for large particle. In this case, we would saturate for one hydrogen per platinum. Ethane reactivity, well, we could explore the various intermediates of this uh, reactivity of ethane, controlling or optimizing the number of hydrogen that the cluster wants to have for each of these uh, this steps. We find metastable surface intermediates due to the loss of entropy at this high 
uh, temperature, the hydrogen coverage and the cluster shape will, will change. Okay? Well, while going along the reaction pathway, the cluster will ad adopt, adapt at best its hydrogen coverage and its shape to the specific species that we form on, on the cluster. And for the reactivity, we have a strong dependence on the pressure, partial pressure ratio, this J uh, parameter. Low J, strong reactivity of the cluster, hence risk of formation of ethylidine and coke precursor. So the system will not be very, very stable. Dehydrogenation and hydrogen analysis will, will compete. For J equal 1 or above, you will strongly reduce the, the trend to form coke precursors or uh, thylidine, and hydrogenolysis will be more disfavored than dehydrogenation, which is a bit uh, counterintuitive. Okay? We have higher hydrogen pressure, we have more hydrogen, and it is hydrogenolysis, the reaction which needs hydrogen, which is more disfavored. But this is due to the nature of the specific um, intermediates that are needed for, for this reaction, which are more affected by the increased hydrogen coverage than uh, those of uh, the dehydrogenation. So at this point, I'd like to thank my uh, co-workers, especially uh, Christophe Magimori, Céline Chizale, and uh, Pascal Rebaud for that, uh, that, uh, that work. Um, I'd like to invite um, all of you to attend the next Europa Cup conference. That will be in Yon in uh, September. Still time, okay? The uh, early registration deadline is finishing uh -huh, in five hours. So if you, <laughs> if you rush to your computers, you still can make it. And I would be very happy to see all of you there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Philippe, for an excellent talk and also for an excellent timing. We have time for uh, a few questions. Let's start with Israel. Philip, uh, your results for three hydrogens for platinum is interesting uh, because hydrogen uh, titration of exposed platinum atoms is, is very important. Uh, method to determine particle size and counting sites of catalytic active sites. So your number uh, is a bit higher than experimentally determined. Can you comment on this, please? Yeah. So I have two comments on that. First one is here. Okay. This is uh, from a team in the, in the U.S. You will recognize the, the author here. So th this is a Xanes experiment on particles as a function of size. And you can see that from this uh, Xanes, uh, the area here of this uh, B peak here in the, in the Xanes, this will show that the H1 platinum ratio is three times higher for the small one than for the largest one. Okay, this would be the S1 and the S9 sample on this graph. Okay? So first, we think that this behavior is, is realistic. Now, coming back to the desorption experiment, if you remember my, my, my thermodynamic slide, is not so far away, so maybe I can go back. Of course, we have three hydrogen atoms. But at given condition here, not three would dissolve. So you will, have, you will keep some irreversibly absorbed hydrogen. And if you look at the dyn dynamic range, it's 1, 1.5. So it's quite close to the one that you measure. So we think that indeed you have a, a delta of 1 or 1 1.5. But at the end of the day, your, your, your particle, if it's small, might not be fully dehydrogenated when you do your, your desorption experiment. Thank you. Okay. Time for a couple more questions, please. So, Thomas, UPMC, Paris. There exists in the literature some indications that at high temperature, the platinum particles may be completely flat, like raft-like mm -hmm. particles. You did not neo-13 cluster you do not consider these hypotheses. Completely flat. Yeah, uh, 2D. Yeah, completely flat. Um, at some point, we considered flat uh, particles, OK, that were a bit, um, well, and this, I would say, this strongly depends on the, 
on how good the addition with the support is. It's a matter of wetting. Okay? So this um, then will depend on, on, on fine details on the, of the support, which I'm afraid goes beyond the, the, the model that, that, that we can have. Okay? Um, it, with, with this model, we find that the fully flat is, is less stable than the two layer, okay? which is already kind of a flashish, uh, uh, flashish one. When we do the MD, in principle, the, the particle can change shape okay, as it wants. So if it would have wanted to, to do it, in principle, it, it could have done it, and we didn't see any, um, I think I have the MD somewhere here. Where is it? It's gone. Yes, this is the MD including the shape. You, you can see how it rearranges to form the cubic hydrogen. And um, at low hydrogen content, we didn't see any, any flattening of the particle in, in this case. Okay, in the interest of time, please join me in thanking Professor Tan once more.